holds a bachelor's degree from the Ohio State University. Please welcome Bob. Thanks, Joe. Always important to get the Ohio State University out there. Am I on? Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. So I want to start with a little... Uh, Try this one more time. There we go. A little background on the company. Untether AI was founded in Toronto um, in 2018. And why Toronto? Well, Toronto actually has the highest concentration of AI startups of anywhere in the world, if you include both silicon and software startups. Um, we have been uh, led in our venture capital rounds, either led or co-led by Intel Capital, a small company right over here around the corner. Um, <clears throat> We also have investments from Radical Ventures, an AI-focused venture capital firm, CPP Investments, which is the Canadian equivalent of CalPERS, uh, Tracker Capital Management, which is the VC arm of a $56 billion private equity fund called Cerberus. And uh, most recently, GM Ventures has gone public um, as a, a strategic investor. Um, so you heard talk about automotive. Obviously, AI is going into the automotive space quite heavily. And we're working with General Motors on their next generation perception system for autonomous vehicles. Uh, we have about 170 employees and we raised $170 million. And as Joe mentioned, we have a unique take on how to accelerate neural networks. And we run them faster, cooler, and more cost effectively using something that we call at memory computation. And the reason we did this is because when you look at running inference workloads. I'm not talking about training, but specifically to inference. Okay, what we're seeing is that the increase in computational requirements is outstripping the ability of silicon to be able to service that. And you also, if you heard Lindley this morning, he talked about the plethora of different types of neural networks, right? So you have to have be scalable and flexible for this changing neural network landscape. Four years ago, people were talking about natural language processing and using transformer networks, but they weren't talking about what's happening today where I'm seeing transformer networks being used in vision applications. So if you were thinking you're going to make a vision AI chip, but you didn't have the types of functionalities necessary to deal with transformer types of networks, you're now out of luck because your chip isn't going to be able to run those very efficiently. And the other thing that a lot of people don't talk about, they always talk about throughput and latency, but they miss accuracy. Accuracy is critical. So if you talk to recommendation engine people, the Facebooks of the worlds that are serving up your ads, a tenth of a percentage degradation in accuracy costs them hundreds of millions of dollars in ad revenue. Similarly, when you start talking about autonomous vehicles, when you have inaccuracies, bad things happen and people get hurt. Right? So we've been focused as well on not only the throughput, but also on accuracy. So when you go to architect one of these AI accelerators, Obviously, being able to get the throughput is important, but that's predicated upon your power efficiency. If you look at a traditional von Neumann architecture, 90% of the energy is in data movement, and only 10% is being used in the actual compute itself. So we took an approach to try to change that calculus and make sure that we're balanced in terms of memory transfer energy and compute energy. You also have the compute granularity. Okay, and this is something that a lot of people have worked on. Myself being an uh, ex-FPGA person where you have fine-grained and coarse-grained FPGAs, but now we're talking about compute. And so by definition, you're going to be much coarser-grained, but you have to have a level of granularity to be able to be efficient in utilizing the resources that you have in the chip. So architecting what that granularity is is really critical. But you also have to have the flexibility so that you don't overfit for a specific type of application. Again, as the example with transformer networks, if you've architected a chip that's really good at 3x3 three three and 5x5 five five convolutions, which is a gem M type of a matrix matrix approach, you go to transformers, guess what? They're gem V, they're matrix vector. And now you have an inefficient architecture. So you don't want to overfit if you're going to try to do a general purpose AI accelerator. And then looking at the accuracy, you also have to look about efficiency, okay? Obviously, the mode accuracy is what you train in. Um, traditionally, you train in a floating point 32 data type. Well, trying to run inference on FP32 is just way too expensive. So people have been doing quantization down to lower data types. But as you do deep quantization, you start sacrificing accuracy. 
So then there's a trade-off there as well. And so you have to look at all of these factors when you're architecting an AI accelerator. So getting first to the power efficiency. What we did was rather than looking at a von Neumann architecture and trying to scale that out, we said, why don't we move the compute to where the actual data is? So we put that in terms of attaching dedicated SRAM blocks to processing elements. And we have hundreds of thousands of these processing elements. What this does is first it gives us the energy efficiency. We use standard 6T SRAM cells, but we optimize the drivers because they have a very short distance. This is not a cache. Right? This is a dedicated memory block to a given processing element. So we can make sure that we get the energy efficiency that we need rather than using a memory compiler. So we custom design that. We custom design the processing elements in the data path in order to ensure the efficiency. But the second thing this gives us is tremendous memory bandwidth. Because we're not sharing caches, we don't have memory contention. So we have terabytes of on-chip memory access for these processing elements to grab the coefficients, to do the multiply accumulate functionality or do reduce functionality, and then um, move on. Uh, you heard from Tetramem earlier about in-memory compute. I won't go in detail. He very well explained the issues associated with that and moving that to productization. But we feel that we're right in between here and it's a sweet spot that's manufacturable at scale. So what we're introducing here is the Speed AI 240. Um, this is a two petaflop device. And at energy efficiency, we're doing 30 teraflops per watt. Uh, you heard talk about RISC-V. We've adopted the RISC-V architecture, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we have 1,458 1, of these RISC-V processors in our chip. And they're attached to the processing elements, which gives us our two petaflops of FP8. And I'll talk about the floating point eight data type. Um, but we also have BF16 support for those that need the utmost in accuracy. Um, the energy efficiency comes from the at memory compute, getting us the 30 teraflops per watt. There's 238 megabytes of on-chip SRAM. Okay, And so what we tend to do is place the entire neural network onto the chip. However, certain situations and certain network architectures, for example, recommendation engines, have very large embedding tables. So we've added LPDDR5 as external memory. We also have some uh, internal cache memories around the I.O. And we have flexible data types. I'm going to talk more about the FP8, but we do reach down to int4 for those that don't care too much about accuracy and all the way up to the BF16 data type. So let's go into the memory bank. And this goes to the granularity aspect I was talking about. In our previous generation, we had a single risk processor controlling 512 of these processing elements. Well, we dug down one more level of granularity. And what we've done is that each row of processing elements, which is 64 processing elements, now have a dedicated row controller that is fed instructions by one of the two risk 5 processors. So now I have a granularity at the row level rather than in a two-dimensional level so that I can be executing a set of instructions on one row in a SIMD approach and then do it separately on each row. So now I have eight separate rows that can all be running different threads of instructions, each of them controlled by a RISC-V processor. Now, the other thing we look at is movement of the data. It's one thing to get from the SRAM array to the processing element. That's typically how coefficients come into the processing element. But when you have your activations, we tend to want to move those in a linear fashion on a row basis. So we have something called a rotator cuff. And that rotator cuff allows us to rotate the activations to each next processing element, bring down the coefficient, do your matrix vector multiplication, store the result, and then move it on. And so in that way, we have a data flow for nearest neighbors. But we've also added east-west and north-south network on chips. These are pipeline knocks so that we can move large amounts of data in either the north-south direction or in the east-west direction. These are very high bandwidth, but they're pipelined so that each clock cycle, it moves a certain distance, again, to economize on the energy efficiency rather than trying to blast the data across the entire chip. 
Now about risk five, in and of itself, there's nothing really unique about it for AI inference workloads and specifically nothing you know, that they had ever contemplated using it for at memory compute. So we took the basic risk five instruction set, but we extended it. We added over 20 custom instructions that are specific to our at memory compute architecture to do these SIMD types of approaches. So things like PE MAC, which is perform a multiply accumulate, PE gem V, perform a gem V uh, multiplication. Okay, those are specific that you won't find in the risk five ISA, specific to AI inference workloads. We'll have something called run PE row reduce. So that's used in transformer networks to do your softmax calculation. Okay, again, custom instruction. So we've heavily modified this specifically to be able to use it, our at memory compute architecture and then also the types of functions that we need for neural network inference acceleration. Now each processor in and of itself, we um, took the 32 EMC and this is important because A, E is the embedded version of RISC-V, M is the multiplier and divider. So we do have a large multiply divider in each RISC-V processor to do aggregation functions. Okay, and C for compressed instructions. So we wanna compress this down because we wanna conserve um, the die area. So each RISC processor has only about six kilobytes of memory to store its instructions and data. And each of them drives one of four, the four row controllers. But again, so we put our kernel code, it's very efficient and we optimize that in what we call a sequential optimization manner in order to ensure that we are using the code efficiently, but also being able to drive the tremendous amount of compute that's available inside of our memory banks. Now the processing element itself is dedicated to neural network inference acceleration. So as you might imagine, it's very efficient at doing things like multiplies, accumulates. Um, the SRAM itself, as I mentioned, is a standard SRAM cell, but we drive it at a very low voltage for the drivers going into the processing elements. So we reach down to 0.4 volts. Again, that's order to um, be energy efficient and reduce the amount of energy per access. The processing element is flexible. It runs an int four, int eight, the FP8 or BF16 support, um, but each of those has their different trade-offs and I'll talk a little bit more about that. We do have structured sparsity circuitry. You heard um, Lindley talking about that a little bit earlier. All the data though I'm showing does not include structured sparsity. What we found in the marketplace is that it's an interesting new technology, but most of our customers aren't ready to adapt to it yet because of the massive cost of retraining to be able to get the structured sparsity uh, support, but we have it there to future-proof the architecture. Now, one other thing that we've done is this reduced functionality here on the bottom, um, and that is really for these transformer types of networks where you need to do softmax types of applications and aggregate a bunch of data and do the, reduc the reduce of a map reduce functionality. And so we've added that as well. So the A register, is your activation register. That is fed by the rotator cuffs, as I mentioned. The C register comes from the SRAM array. Those are your coefficients. We have a temperature regis temporary register file. And then we have a buffer, and that's to store data that may be coming in through the north-south or the east-west NOx, so that can get there as well and then be put into the necessary registers for it to be calculated. Okay, about the FP8, and you heard Lindley talk about this as well. Um, unbeknownst to us, we don't talk to NVIDIA, but NVIDIA was working on this in a training realm for their, up their newest hopper architecture. Meanwhile, we were looking at FP8 for inference. Because what we saw is that we could actually create circuitry in silicon to do floating point calculations at 8 bits that is more efficient than doing integer 8 calculations, which has kind of been the standard up until now for AI inference but we have a 2x power advantage by using FP8 data types. But when we were doing this, we also saw that depending upon the number of mantissa bits and exponent bits, you may have a degradation in accuracy. And what we saw in our case for inference, the precision mode for us, which is four mantissa bits and three exponent bits, 
gives us that nudge of accuracy that we need in order to be as good or better than int8 data types. If we only had the range version, which was the three mantissa bits, it actually showed a slight degradation to the int8 data type. And so we have both, and we mix and match those depending upon the layer of the neural network we're calculating in order to preserve accuracy, but also give us that efficiency. Now, in NVIDIA's case, they have uh, a range and precision version as well, but their range is two mantissa bits, and their precision is three mantissa bits. So you think, okay, well, yeah, one engineering company came up with this, the other one came up with this. Why would they be a little bit different? It's because of the workload that they're trying to solve. In the case of NVIDIA, it's a training machine. And when you're doing training and you're doing back propagation, you have much larger dynamic ranges than when you're doing inference, which is typically just the feed forward approach. So they needed that, their range value in order to preserve the accuracy when they're doing training and back propagation. But when we saw we wanted to run inference, we need that extra anticipit on some of the layers. Now it's just, there's a coincidence that uh, Hopper was announced about four or five months ago, and we're announcing our chip, and we have a uh, intersection of the FPA data type. So their precision version is the same as our range version. So what this means is that if you train in NVIDIA Hopper using their FPA precision, we can take that and run it directly as is without having to do quantization or post-quantization retraining. So the accuracy that you get and what you train for, you can now deploy directly on an inference-specific type of piece of silicon. Okay, a little bit about the interconnectivity, because this is really important, obviously, in terms of when you talk about large language models, massive throughput, you have to make sure that you're right-sizing your network on chips in order to be able to move the data. So in our case, most of the data movement is inside the array of memory banks. So we have very high bandwidth memory, uh, network on chips between the memory banks. In the east-west direction, um, it's on the order of 1.5 terabytes. In the north-south direction, it's 1.9 terabytes. And then those communicate to an I.O. ring network on chip. And this is a new innovation and expands the entire ring of the chip, but it provides the buffer between the actual compute cores and then the I.O. So each of these I.O. has its own PCM. It's called a pipeline control module, which is used to take the internal representation of the data that's in our NOx and then translate it into whatever we need to do to either drive PCI Express, to drive the LPDDR memory controllers. Um, and that buffering gives us some flexibility in terms of what we put on the I.O. In this chip, this is the Speed AI 240, which is our infrastructure class chip, you'll notice that we have a lot of high bandwidth PCI Express. There's a BI-16 Gen 5, that's to connect to a host CPU. But then there's three PCIe Gen 5s by 8. Those are to do chip-to-chip -chip interconnect. Because we certainly see why we like to put the entire model on the chip. The models are so large now that it's going to be a multi-chip implementation. So we have this direct connectivity between the chips through PCI Express to allow us to scale to multi-chip cards or even drive between cards in a server. As I mentioned with the LPDDR interface, that's to store the large embedding tables. Or if you want to run a large model but on a single chip, we can store all the information, coefficients, and layers and swap in and out layers. So run half the network first, store the intermediate data, bring in the instructions for the next half of the layers of the network, run that. And so that gives a flexibility to our customers in terms of if they don't need the throughput and latency of the entire network on chip, they can use less chips um, and go ahead and reduce their overall bomb cost. So this provides a tremendous amount of efficiency. Um, I mentioned Hopper at the top of the hour, um, and that's the primary competi competitor that we look at. So their PCI Express card um, that Lindley mentioned, it's about 1.6 petaflops of FP8 performance. Um, and it runs an efficiency standpoint of about 4.6 teraflops per watt. Okay, in our case, with our Speed AI device, we can put six chips 
onto a single PCI Express card with a similar TDP envelope. But because we're much more energy efficient, we can do 12 petaflops in a single PCI Express card at that 30 teraflops per watt energy efficiency. And that's really the compute density. And you heard Lindley talking about, you know, say, well, the data centers don't really care about power. Well, they really do care about power, but not in the way you think. It's not about super low power. It's about energy efficiency and compute density. The fact that I can use the same amount of energy and I can get 5x greater performance is a big win for them. And that's the types of things that we see um, that we, uh, when we engage with those types of customers. Now, there's lies, damn lies, and teraflops. Um, what you really want to understand is like, how accessible are those flops? Can I really use them to do the types of neural networks that I need? And in this case, we can, right? In that, depending upon the neural network, whether it's vision networks or natural language processing networks, we're on the order of seven to 50 times greater throughput. Um, and that's because of our energy efficiency measured in frames per second per watt or queries per second per watt. That I.O. knock gives us the capability to change the I.O. easily. And because we're a spatial architecture, we can now make smaller devices, similar to FPGAs. So the Speed AI 240 is our first chip, but we're going to make three other devices at different thermal points. We'll have a 10-watt chip, a 1-watt chip, and even a sub-1-watt chip for different types of applications going from the infrastructure to the edge. And as we see die-to-die -die interconnects standardizing like UCIE, we'll be able to replace those PCIe chip-to-chip -chip interconnects with UCIE die-to-die -to, -die to be able to have heterogeneous multi-chip modules in small form factors. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our first generation of devices. And one of the things that was key about it is the new software. So we're already deploying this, but with our latest version of software, we now have the ability to allow our customers to write their own custom kernels. So we can now have a high performance compute design flow as opposed to a push button neural network design flow. Software is critical, as you heard Lindley talk about. We have more software engineers than we have hardware designers. And we continue to invest in that to be able to um, provide this type of capability because our customers do indeed want to write their own code. So with that, I'll stop and open it up for any questions you might have. I'm sure we'll have some. Please raise your hand. We have a microphone in the back. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that your floating point A specific format are targeted at certain applications. Can you explain what type of application can further take advantage of this type of format? Well, so for the FP8 applications, right, it's going to give you more compute density at a similar accuracy as int 8. So that's for most of your vision networks, natural language processing networks that are call and response. For networks that have really sensitivity to accuracy, recommendation engines, um, NLP text generation, because the errors compound, you'll probably want to go and use a mixture of FP8 with a BF16 data type to ensure that you're keeping that accuracy. So even on the inference side? Absolutely. This is all about inference, right? We're not a training chip. We, we, we only do inference. Thank you. So a lot of the ML um, chips are kind of focused on these larger, you know, imaging, video type problems. But, you know, I see applications where I may have 200 channels of data I need to run AI on, you know, time series type things. I mean, does this architecture lend itself to those types of ML? training or is it more oriented towards these uh, other types of traditional things that people are chasing with this, these chips? No, we've made a general purpose AI accelerator so that we can do, you know, what you mentioned, an LSTM or a recursive network. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We have the flexibility in our knocks. They can go bi-directional. They're, they're absolutely bi-directional so we can feed forward or go back. So we can support RNNs, LSTMs. Um, in addition to your traditional convolutional networks or transformer networks. Okay, thank you. So I have a question. So yeah. it seemed, um, kind of sticking with the theme of this particular session, we're talking about the app memory compute. 
you know, AI seems uniquely well suited to the application of this and vice versa. Are there any other applications of at memory compute that spring to mind? Yes, so we do, and you know, part of the reason why I talked to real briefly about the software is that we have some customers that are looking at us for traditional high performance compute and high performance simulation applications. So at its base, we're a linear algebra accelerator. So you want to do high performance simulation trajectory analysis. You can do that um, with custom kernel code specific to that. You wouldn't do that from a neural network. You'd write it at a low level base of code. Right. Right. Um, uh, signal processing. So we have people who are in the signal intelligence area that they want to do some front end FFTs, DFTs prior to going to their neural network to do the actual signature analysis, which in which case I'd have a classification network. So right. those types of things as well. Um, I will say though that you know, for some of that, you really want that 16-bit floating point because of the accuracy issues. Right, especially scientific computing. But yeah, yeah, sounds good. Any other questions? So, all right, then I'll ask you one. Sure. You, you talked a little bit about power consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, do do people ever talk about the kind of the ecological impact of consuming power, or is it more like like essentially that just reduces down to for a given amount of power, I want to get more work done, and thus it kind of falls out and doesn't need to be explicitly stated. Sure. Uh, so I think at a top level, the industry is concerned ecologically about power consumption. You know, depending upon the projections you see, uh, people are saying data centers now take 1% of the world's energy, and that's going to go to 15 to 25% of the world's energy. Um, and that's obviously a concern. So there's people working on alternative energy sources for data centers, but also being more efficient in the power and increasing the compute is very important because it goes directly to the total cost of ownership. And so when we talk to our customers, they look at this as saying, okay, you're gonna save me on my capital costs up front because your silicon is inherently more efficient and cheaper than GPUs, but also my total cost of ownership because it's gonna take me less energy to the same amount. That saves me money and is a, you know, a greener alternative. Right. There's a microphone. Well, we do, we do have people online so I'd like to use the microphone. Yeah, I, I think this definitely has uh, seems like it has uh, energy efficiency compared to digital solution. But how about the cost compared to the conventional digital solution as well as maybe flash or RAM based in memory computing? Because you're going to put a lot of the SRAM uh, on chip. Yeah, so we do put a lot of SRAM on chip. Um, but you know, when I look at my die size analysis, and we don't disclose die sizes, don't ask. But when I look at what our die size is compared to my number one competitor, Hopper H100, I know that I'm much more efficient from a silicon efficiency. I can get more tops in a given piece of silicon. They still have tremendous amounts of cash on those chips. They have hundreds of megabytes of SRAM cash, just like we have it, but we're not cash, we're distributed. And then they have HBMs, we have LPDDR um, in terms of our external storage. Um, so, no, from a silicon standpoint, we are significantly more efficient. And also, because we're purely digital with, ST, with you know, SRAM cells, we follow the process technologies. Our first generation was 16 nanometer. This is 7 nanometer. There's no reason we can't go to 5 and 3. Um, and so we'll be able to stay directly on top of the latest process technologies. And even though your SRAMs are customized, it's still in a standard Yeah, so there, it's, a, it's a standard 6T cell. We don't okay, wanna, you're we, not going to redo it. We're not going to mess with the 6T cell because bad things happened because TSMC has you know, really optimized that. Yeah. What we deal with is the word line drivers, the bit line drivers, and how we get the data from the memory cell to our processing. And element. those change in drivers don't affect the processing. Don't element. affect. No, we make sure that we make sure that we don't mess with the actual characterization of the cell. Okay. Um, not to say that we've looked at other technologies, flash, reram, memristors, all of that, but from where we stand, what we want to do is make a manufacturable at scale approach and a scalable architecture. And so we stay with the standard processes. Okay. More questions? I got to ask you about software. You talk about having a lot of software developers. Um, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about it, but 
I mean, would you agree with Lindley that that's one of the big barriers to overcome to get customers to start using your, your It absolutely product? is. It's the number one barrier. Um, and I don't think Untether AI is unique in that approach, in, in that, in that. Right, I didn't mean to be yeah, right. specifically, so, uh, no, but I mean. No, but it, it absolutely is. As a startup, there's a certain amount of things you can do, right? And so once you have an architecture and then you develop a compiler for that architecture, we have a unique one because we have a both spatial optimizations across the different memory banks and sequential. But once you have that in place and you have the modicum of support, the customers want to be masters of their own destiny. They want to be able to say, okay, now I've come up with a new neural network. It has this layer that I just invented. Guess what? That kernel doesn't exist in your library. How can I do that? And that's what you know, our latest release is, is that we've now opened up that development so that they can write their own kernel that, that runs on the RISC-V processors that mirrors what that layer is that they created in TensorFlow or PyTorch. So now we're not the bottleneck in terms of making sure that we have a kernel library. We let our customers be masters of their own destiny and they can write everything that they need to get whatever it is they wanna do from a neural network approach or a high performance computing and doing that bare metal programming. Perfect, well with that, let's leave it at this and uh, go get lunch. Okay, thank you.